Good morning. So I hope you all are nice and awake. Um, I'm not quite. I'm still a little jet lagged. I hope I will be enthusiastic enough for you. Um, so uh, as as he said, my name is Greg Bledsoe, and I am a longtime gray-bearded sysadmin uh, who has been through the tech wars and the flame wars all the way back to Usenet uh, when we argued over, uh, you know, Emacs versus VI, and, uh, you know, so that's how far back I go. Um, uh, and I am lately a managing consultant with Accenture, uh, delivering, uh, I'm in the, we have a new group called the DevOps Arch Architecture Group, and uh, we are in many, many clients who are seeking to implement this uh, as uh, uh, Accenture is internally. Accenture is also being disrupted internally by the DevOps movement, and it's disrupting some of the internal business, you know, um, because uh, we're kind of sidestepping a lot of the frameworks and other kinds of uh, traditional models uh, that have been very important to a lot of companies and to Accenture itself. But um, <clears throat> if you want to know more about me, I hope you, by the time we finish this, hopefully you will know whether or not I'm worth uh, following. Um, so um, we all know that culture, the cultural issues are the, the, the ones that really hamper us. The technology is easy comparatively. Uh, and changing your organization doesn't help if you don't, uh, if you haven't already established a culture that allows you to implement a lot of these ideas. Uh, we're going to talk about why and some things that you can do with, you can do about it, no matter who you are and no matter where you are. There are some universal things that you can do as an individual without any positional power to start effecting change. You can affect change uh, much more easily if you do have a position of, of positional power. Uh, but it is not necessary. Um, you can, the smallest force will deflect the boulder uh, a little bit. And if you apply that enough times, you can change the course of the boulder rolling down the hill. Um, and that's, what we're, that's basically what we're talking about doing. A, a company's legacy infrastructure and culture is like a big boulder rolling down a hill. And what you don't do is jump in front of it and throw your hands up uh, and yell stop because you'll be crushed. Uh, what you do is you come alongside it, and you just keep nudging it in the right direction. You just nudge it over and over and over until you've changed its course. Now, you as an individual can do that, uh, and you can invite others in to help you do that as well. And we're going to talk about tools and techniques um, to do that. But first of all, so that you can get the full effect, the full um, understanding of the perspective that I'm offering you, we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, you know, um, why uh, we want to do that. So, why do we want DevOps? Um, DevOps is an increasingly uh, popular phrase to use. Um, it's just that the, the idea has, I think, firmly penetrated the mainstream of IT now. Um, it took a while for that to happen. For a long time, it was just nerds uh, that were using the word. And I, I still think we don't have a, a, a uniform definition, which would be very helpful. Um, so I'll tell you what I mean by DevOps. Um, and I'll tell you what I mean by culture. Uh, and that should help us um, along our... Uh, problem-solving journey. So we want DevOps because DevOps is magic. Because DevOps does, allows us to do amazing things. I mean, if you think about some of the statistics that come out of companies that have fully embraced some of the principles that we're talking about, they see a 30-time increase in deploy rate in how fast they can deploy concurrent with a 120 time lower defect rate. Um, that's quite frankly amazing. And if, 
sorry, hang on one second here. If, if, you ha- if, 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 I, if my past self had come back in time, uh, or if my future self went back in time to my past self and told him some of the things that I've been able to accomplish in my career, um, my past self, who was struggling to manage 10 servers, you know, um, 10 servers was a lot of servers to manage back then. And then over time, we got to the point where one sysadmin could manage 50 servers. And then one sysadmin could manage 75 servers. And then one one sysadmin could manage maybe 100 servers. And we thought, man, we've got this figured out. We understand how to do this. And then my my present self goes back in time and tells him, you know, that we achieve 100% uptime through deploys, database changes, servers crash, nobody cares, um, you know. Uh, my, my past self would, 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 you know, think that was, that was magic. My past self would, in fact, um, think that he was talking to advanced aliens, possibly. So advanced that they were almost gods performing magic. Because that's really what, what, what some of the things that we're doing now are, are that advanced compared to what we used to do. Um, but the, big, the, the, the most important question is how do we achieve these goals? Um, what are the characteristics of, Dev, uh, of DevOps that allow us to do that? How is it that DevOps can allow us to achieve this magic? Um, and here's, these are actually some of the side effects of DevOps. Um, a lot of the side effects are well known. We all understand them now. Um, we've seen these things happen. Um, we, you know, understand now that we make IT very much more valuable to our to our companies. Um, this is an this is an insanely good thing for us in IT. We've gone from being the undervalued. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? You know, IT crowd to probably the most important business partners in terms of creating value for the shareholders, for our uh, customers, and for our employers. Um, This is not really our topic, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, The most important thing for us with, with these is that we have to understand why. The first question to answer is why. Why does DevOps achieve this? Why does DevOps allow us to do these things? Um, So to start with, I'll tell you that um, the term DevOps is probably a bit antiquated at this point. Um, I attended an event called the Future of DevOps Debate uh, in New York uh, with some big names that you would recognize, uh, and we talked about the term DevOps. We spent quite a bit of time debating whether we should stick with the term DevOps or not. And essentially, I take uh, John Willis' argument that um, we're kind of stuck with it. We put all this work into developing it. It's just now penetrating the mainstream. Why would we change it? Um, DevOps has become much more than it originally meant. Um, But we still, we have this term. It was designed to be an inclusive term. And so we're going to continue to use it inclusively. So all of these, so, so because DevOps seems to give the impression that all we're talking about is development and operations, when actually now we're talking about the entire business, we're talking about bringing in all of the, the, the stakeholders of the business. We're talking about bringing in security and QA and uh, biz dev and marketing. We're bringing all of these guys in. And, forming, and putting them into our teams. They're just embedded in the process on these autonomous teams that are creating pipelines. Uh, and, you know, you're, we're far beyond just DevOps. Um, the, the term DevOps actually became the word because what we're doing is actually eliminating waste. We're finding wasteful things and we're getting rid of them. Whatever is not adding value whatever is adding friction, whatever is costing us time, we're getting rid of it. It, We are mercilessly executing all the elements of our business that are not adding 
business value. We're identifying them and we're killing them. And the very first one of those was the wall between dev and ops. Because how, many t- how much time did we waste throwing things over the wall from dev to ops? And ops says, this doesn't deploy, and they throw it back. And dev says, well, we think we fixed it, and they throw it back. And then ops says, well, it still doesn't work, and they throw it back. And how, long, how much time did we waste there? When if the ops guy went and sat with the dev guys and said, this is why it doesn't deploy, and this is how you avoid ever having this happen again, right? If he looked at it from the developer's perspective and the developer looked at it from the ops perspective, you eliminate this source of waste. This was the first and biggest source of waste that was attacked by applying the principles of DevOps, which are actually lean manufacturing principles. So what we're actually talking about, I think if you were going to properly name it, you would not name it DevOps, you would name it Lean Software Delivery. That's actually what we're talking about. We're far beyond DevOps. But we're going to stick with the term DevOps. And so in the past, in order to draw distinctions and let people know what I'm talking about, I would use terms like DevSecOps, DevQAOps, BizDev, DevOps, you know, all of these kinds of things. I'm abandoning all that. I'm sticking with DevOps, but I'm giving the disclaimer that what I'm really talking about is lean software delivery. Because, and this actually is very important. It makes a huge difference in terms of our target. What is it that we actually need to achieve in order to receive the benefits? So... We have three main obstacles that we encounter when we attempt to apply these principles. Cultural, organizational, and technical. So in DevOps, we talk about our three tools that we use to address these. People, process, technology, in that order. So we have three solutions. People, process, and tools. Now, we say them in this order for a reason. People, process, tools. Because this is the order of their importance, it's the order of their dependence, but it's also the order of their difficulty. The tools is by far the easiest part. And because of this, many people will begin their discussion of DevOps by talking about tools, by talking about the tool chain. This is, the, this is a DevOps tool chain you can use. This is an integration method that you can use. This is something that you can use. And then, um, so I didn't actually get permission to talk about any Accenture clients by name, So I can't, but I'll tell you that there are a number of uh, Accenture clients that have all these tools, and they're using each and every one of them separately and manually. So tools do not make DevOps. Tools can actually become, you trying to use the tools without the culture can be an impediment to DevOps. And this is a very important principle to understand. It's the the easiest thing to talk about, the easiest thing to change, the easiest thing to get your head around are the tools. And so people want to start the discussion there. But this client that I was talking about has all these tools being used independently. And so now they say, well, the tools aren't working. We need to change our organizational structure. So they have a DevOps team. We're going to hire in some DevOps engineers, and we're going to have a DevOps team, and they're going to lead our DevOps implementation. And do you know what they were able to accomplish? Exactly zero. They were able to make virtually no change. So organizational changes do not make DevOps. Additional teams do not make DevOps. These, are, these don't work. The culture must come first. So... Why 
did these techniques fail for the client? Because the corporate culture is one of hierarchical silos where you have a reporting structure that is side by side for all of these groups trying to do all of these things. You have a monitoring team, a QA team, an ops team, a dev team, and just putting them in a room and saying talk to each other doesn't change the fact that you've given them all different incentives. Because you said to dev, pump out this code with these features as quickly as possible. That's all you're going to be praised for, and it's all you're going to be, uh, that's all you'll suffer consequences for. And you have an ops team, and you said the environment should not go down. And the envi- you should never you know, put a, work, a bill that doesn't work on production. And if you do, you are going to be possibly fired. If we have too much downtime, if, we have, if our builds don't work, you may get fired. And then you have a QA team. No defects should get onto production. So everyone's incentives are different. Having them talk to each other doesn't help. So what we're talking about is a problem of misaligned incentives. They do not share a common goal. Each has their own individual goal, and they are impediments to each other to be overcome. And when you have hierarchical silos like this, you will often have a blame-shifting culture. There's a problem. It's their problem. Nope, it was their problem. Because somebody's going to have to pay for this, right? If we have a problem, it's somebody's fault, and we need to know who, and we need to deal with that person or that team or that manager, right? And so we have a, a, a culture of covering your butt. The hierarchical silos destroy DevOps. That's, pro- that's the major impediment. So... At this point, we probably need to start defining what culture is. What are we talking about when we talk about culture? So, loosely defined, um, a culture is a set of habitual and autonomic unconscious responses to stimuli of a collective group. So, from the time you were born, your parents taught you that you respond to this event in this way. Uh, And your school taught you these are acceptable and these are unacceptable ways of being in the world. Your uh, friends taught you these things are cool and these things are uncool. And you just unconsciously absorbed all of these things. And these became just a part of you that you don't recognize Uh, and you don't even know that they're operating, but they are. They're they're influencing every decision you make, every action you take. And I'll give you an example uh, of something I realized about myself that I had to overcome. So when I was uh, in, uh, about a million years ago, when I was uh, in the the, uh, military, in the reserves, um, the, the, the company CO asked me to clean uh the uh, grill, because we were going to have a cookout for the company, and he asked me to clean the grill. And I don't think the grill had ever been cleaned before. Uh, And I I was given paper towels to do this with. And so I said, I've been told to do this job with these tools. And so I applied myself to this task. I ran out of paper towels and got more. And I ran out of paper towels, and I got more. And I worked for hours and hours and hours and hours. And finally, the CO came back, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm making this clean using the tools that you provided. And he just, <sighs> he's like, please return to your regular duty. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't occur to me to take a step back and ask, why is this not working? Is there a more efficient way to do this? Because I believed in the chain of command and doing doing it the way I was told with the tools I was given. And I think um, American culture is is like this. 
Uh, we had a discussion about this uh, yesterday. Uh, some of the, the speakers at dinner were talking about this, that um, American culture is really, really bad about trying to fit the square peg in the round hole. And if it doesn't fit, you just need a bigger hammer. And this is a cultural construct that a, a, a sort of um, don't question authority way of being in the world that's a part of the culture in which I was raised. Because of who my, my father is, my father was, uh, um, went to a military school and he was law enforcement and chain of command was very important to him and that's how our house ran. And I absorbed that. And then I went uh, to basic training and advanced individual training and it, that made it a lot worse. Because they drill into you from day one, you, you follow every lawful order. And it doesn't matter if the order is dumb, it doesn't matter if what you're being told to do won't work, you die trying. And so, this was just a part of who I was. And then one day, I was performing a task with someone, and they were like, you know what, this is really hard. I think that we could make this a lot easier if we found another tool. And it's like, I suddenly had the realization that I was a total moron. I should have figured this out a long time ago. If something is hard, if something isn't working, find another tool. Find another way to do it. Find a better way. Figure out what the problem is. Back up a step. Do root cause analysis. Why did this not work? Fix that problem. Right? So, a corporate culture is a product of both the larger culture in which the organization was formed, uh, the culture and mentality of the founders, what they have encouraged and discouraged in their employees from day one, and this culture just builds up around this. And people learn over time what they will be praised for and what they will get fired for. And they do the things they will be praised for and get promotions for and get raises for. And they will avoid the things that they will get fired for and, get, and be viewed as mediocre for and be viewed as troublemakers for. This is natural human behavior. And these are things that we are taught. in cult These are cultural constructs that we absorb and they form the cultures in which we must do business. Not all cultures are created equal. Not all cultures produce similar effects. People from one culture applying their, their way of thinking to one problem can produce vastly superior results from an economic perspective. From the efficiency and the input of resources to gain the maximum output is what I mean when I say better. So I'm not, just, I'm not saying better in, a very, in an abstract sense. I'm saying better in a very measurable, objective sense, economically, in terms of the input of energy and the output of result. And already? Wow, I'm, running, I'm already running out of time. Um, so... So cultural... Culture represents an enormous inertia of habitual, autonomic responses to stimuli and influence um, that we have to influence, shift, uh, before we can start realigning incentives. So now a startup has an advantage in this regard because a startup can and should intentionally and thoughtfully build a desired culture. Uh, an established company in an established industry comes with a culture and it just is what it is. And this is where you start, and this is what you have to deal with. Now, most people have a job in an established company with an established culture. And so, we're stuck. So, the cultural, and the cultural influences are so powerful that once you build a culture that has adopted these principles, organizational obstacles almost disappear, no matter what the reporting structure is. The reporting structure becomes irrelevant because incentives are aligned. Because now you've figured out 
that we all have a stake in the outcome, the ultimate outcome, which is providing value to whoever our customer is. Whoever it is that's benefiting from what we're building. So, when there's buy-in and the culture's developed and you've, you've flattened things out, you've eliminated hierarchy, um, you've, you're bringing, now you're bringing in more collaborators, um, because now it occurs to you, oh, you know what? Our security guys have a perspective that we're not thinking of when we're just trying to pump out the features. And so we're just handing this off to our uh, production team, and then we're like, oh, yeah, we need to secure this. And then we call in the security guys and say, hey, make this secure, which can never really be done because you, didn't, you weren't thinking about um, whether you're encrypting the traffic between your components. You weren't thinking about uh, you know, uh, whether your data is encrypted at rest, and you weren't thinking about whether or not you have SQL injection in your, uh, uh, or database injection in your, in your application. You're not, because that's not the, the best perspective that you have. So you start bringing in more and more collaborators. And these things happen automatically because the goal is to eliminate waste and produce more value. And the early feedback is a key part of DevOps, which means we find problems as quickly as possible because that's when they're the cheapest to solve. So the technical problems are the easiest of all to solve. Um, and because there's a certain point where you realize that, that DevOps is not about solving technical problems. It's about solving business problems. It's about solving economic problems. So your first and most important lesson in changing a culture is to always tie the solution, the DevOps mindset, to the business goals. That this will make a difference to the deliverables, to measurable deliverables. So let's think about why our, my, my, my client, my hypothetical client, that is probably a percentage of clients, actually, um, why they failed. What, what, would have sa- what would save them? Integration is a function of collaboration. You cannot integrate if you do not collaborate. Collaboration happens when incentives are aligned. Because we have the same goal. Incentives become aligned when you collapse hierarchical silos. Hierarchical silos collapse when management's own incentives are aligned to the business goals. So when this happens, you stop blame shifting and you start problem solving. And people begin to feel safe in exploring the cause of the problem because we're not going to looking for someone to blame, we're looking for what we need to fix. We're, we're doing root cause analysis and we're asking the question, why did this happen? Why did we get this negative or positive result? Because why is always the most important question. It is the question that should drive all our decisions, is the understanding of why. Blame-free root cause analysis is one of the most critical cultural components that must be that must be cultivated. So what we are really talking about is creating a culture that takes advantage of every possible opportunity to improve. We are not wasting our 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 chances to fix things. In other words, Kaizen. You've heard this term. I'm probably saying a lot of things you've heard. I'm probably telling you a lot of things that are obvious after you've heard them. I always know I've had a good idea when I I realize it, and I realize I should have known that a long time ago. Truth is often obvious in retrospect. And so Kaizen is a Japanese term, 
And again, like, as I said, this comes out of lean manufacturing principles. Much of this is, is a product of lean manufacturing principles. So what is exactly Kaizen? So Kaizen grew from lean manufacturing principles that made uh, Japan the dominant force in manufacturing um, at some point after World War II. Um, and probably rivaling Germany in terms of excellence in manufacturing. Germany was the king of the hill, and Japan was coming close to dethroning them, and it happened very quickly. Japan had had that spot for a long time, and suddenly Japan was neck and neck. And the reason was Kaizen. The reason was the principle of eliminating waste. And this was, the, this was why the Japanese were killing American cars. Their cars ran forever, and our cars fell apart after five years. And this was just a truth you had to accept. If you wanted to buy an American car, you were buying a car that was going to last five years because the tolerances weren't tight. And it's precisely because of those things that I talked about. So the Japanese manufacturing line, if something didn't fit, they pull a rope and stop the line. Every employee is empowered to do this. And, they, and then the manager comes and thanks them, and they say, now let's back up and figure out what went wrong and why this doesn't fit. Whereas the Americans get a part off the line and it doesn't fit, so they get a rubber mallet and they start moving things around and shifting things until it drops into place. We fit the square peg in the round hole no matter what. And we, didn't, we don't back up. All right? So the first and biggest wall that we eliminated in DevOps is the wall between Dev and Ops, the biggest source of waste, and thus the name. The second biggest source of waste are hierarchical silos that misalign incentives. So if you come away from this with one word or with one phrase and one concept that should change the way you view this, it should be misaligned incentives. People will do whatever you give them an incentive to do. And if you're giving them the wrong incentives, they will do the wrong things. And this is exactly what we're doing in most of our, our businesses. So, I hope to be here with at least 10 minutes left. Um, didn't make it. So, um, what are the cultural inhibitors? So, as far as I know, I've never seen anyone systematically try to work through what are the cultural factors that inhibit DevOps and what can be done to help with these. So the number one is hierarchical silos that's, that come from turf protection or blame shifting. I think the second biggest one that I think maybe Germany has a, a little bit of an issue with um, maybe more than the U.S. does. We have, certainly have our own problems that you don't have. But this is one that maybe you guys have a little bit more than us. Is the idea that no one has anything to teach us. We've, this, look, we do pretty good. We, look, we got the strongest economy in Europe. We're, we're not hurting, right? So what do, we, what do we need to hear what everybody else is doing for? Right? So the problem with that is, it, no matter how well you're doing, when you're resistant to learning, and that's what hubris is, hubris is the idea that you have nothing to learn, you are actually resistant to learning. So we have this thing called the internet today that allows ultra-wide collaboration. So if you are not willing to learn from the successes and failures that are being reported from the entire rest of the world, I mean, why? Are things so perfect that they can't be better? Where is that true? I want to move there. I mean, that, that, this is, that doesn't exist. So the other one is, well, this is just what we've always done. 
It's convention, a conventional culture, a conservative, change-resistant culture. Because remember, what we really want to do is embrace good change. The good change is the change that comes out of our analysis of waste. We've identified where our waste is, and we need to get rid of it. And another cultural element is what are we afraid of? What are the things that scare us? Fear. Every culture has things that it fears and things that it prizes. So fear of mistakes. I'm not going to stick my neck out because if I make a mistake, I'm, I could get fired. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to get a promotion. If I make a mistake, I'm going to be yelled at. of not accomplishing the goal. Well, if I try and I don't achieve it, then I failed and I will be perceived as a failure. And risk aversion. Risk aversion is a really tricky one because we have to manage risk. And so you have a manager who knows the biggest source of mistakes is people, and now you're telling him, empower these people. And he, what he's hearing is turn them loose and let them do whatever they want, which is actually the opposite of what we're saying. We're saying substitute manual action for pre-negotiated, standardized automation, which will be far more reliable than what you're doing now. But it's hard to make that distinction because of the cultural mindset that sees empowerment as the opportunity for individuals to mess things up. And what we're actually doing is eliminating the opportunities for people to mess things up by standardizing. So what we really have to do here is embrace a culture of Continuous improvement. Improvement is good. So, when you remove all these cultural inhibitors, this is what you get. Kaizen. Which means, we remove waste. And waste is whatever does not provide business value. We will ruthlessly eliminate this waste. And in doing so, we will vastly improve our ability to deliver business value. We actually embrace failure, what we used to think of as failure. When a part doesn't fit, we perform root cause analysis to find out why, rather than saying, somebody did something wrong. There's a problem back, the, back up the, in the line that we have to figure out. So, these are all things that you probably know are products of DevOps, but didn't know why. Now you know why. So, let's say you want to go home and you want to start implementing these things. How do you do that? So, I, I'm, I'm trying to develop what I'm kind of calling the champion's toolkit. You want to go back and you want to start making change. You want to start encouraging people to start embracing these ideas. How do you do that? What do you do? Normally, revolutionaries wind up losing their heads. And you don't want this to happen. So what are the tools that you can use to lead a quiet cultural revolution and not lose your head? So remember that one pebble can start an avalanche. One pebble can start an avalanche. You dropped one rock off the top of the cliff, and as it rolls, it picks up steam, and others start to roll with it, and eventually, there's a lot of energy and a lot of momentum. It starts with one. It starts with one, and that one can be you. So I'm not telling you that you can do this quickly. I'm not telling you that you can do this uh, necessarily even easily, but I'm telling you that you can get started today. And the quicker you start, the quicker you make progress, which is a key agile and lean lesson. Don't wait. Go home 
and get started. So in order to do this, it's not about your technical skills, although you, get, you certainly get a lot more respect if you have great technical skills. When you, are, when you have the deep technical expertise, people believe you know what, that, that you know what you're talking about, and that can translate to other subjects. Expertise in one area absolutely does not translate to expertise in other areas, but people think it does. People think, wow, this guy's really smart, so I'm going to believe what he says about, you know, uh, methane, which the two really don't have any relation. Um, it is true that someone who's very smart can often reason things out, um, but they're not necessarily related. But you can use this to your advantage. If, you, if that is a tool that's in your toolkit, deep technical expertise, you should leverage it. You will be listened to more quickly. So the soft skills are hard for us nerds because we think that's politics. And we, we, we analytical people find politics very distasteful because we equate it with manipulating people. That was so hard for me when I first started my career. I, I, people, I'm like, oh man, these people think that their way forward is to backstab and to blame shift and they don't care about what's right, they care about what's expedient for their career. And you know, to me, to, I think to most of us who have that kind of uh, technical, analytical, sysadmin-y kind of way of being in the world, truth is, the truth should be obvious. Once I've realized something, once I, once I know the solution, everyone should just know that that's right and do it. But that's not the way the world works. So you're always selling. Even getting a job, you're selling yourself. So the first thing that we have to change about our own mindset is that we're salespeople and we're marketers. And we have to go back and start working on selling and marketing our ideas. So really, really hone your soft skills. Listening, collaboration, negotiation, diplomacy. You know, you can do this in a 100% positive way without ever criticizing anyone, without ever calling attention to anyone, without ever calling anyone by name. You can do it by being positive. You can do it by being inclusive. You can, you're inviting people in. Always inviting people in. Always inviting everyone in so that we can all get the benefit together. So you're selling to people's pain points. Look, I know that, you know, you've got to, you really need these features on production. People who have been doing this are getting things on production 30 times faster. You know, there's a, I know of a mainframe shop that has 150 applications that they deploy 400 times a day. So it can be done. We can do this. We can make this much faster. So this is really the keys to changing the culture is you're making this a positive experience. So Take the long-term view. You don't get everything you want today, but you can get what you want in the long term. You'll be told no many times, but no is, an, is a necessary step on the path to yes. You have to get a lot of no's to get to that yes. You don't have to win the war today. Win a battle today. Get, get one person, get one person to change their mind. So once you've embraced and honed these skills, there are a few things that you can do to start making, to start the pebble rolling down the hill. Number one, identify the allies. Who is, with whom do you have ideological convergence? Who agrees with you? These are your allies. Enlist them. Tell them to smile. Help them hone their soft skills. Remind them not to go in and be a sourpuss. And just complain. Complaining doesn't accomplish things. Right? But making an argument, making a reasoned argument in a positive way with a smile on your face does. And when you do these things, you can actually, uh, even a grumpy old curmudgeon like me can do these things. So after you've identified your allies, create a groundswell of demand. So... You just start sharing the ideas. You start talking about these things. You continue to inform yourself. Continue thinking about them. Continue developing the concepts. 
So the, uh, I've often said that a, a successful pilot project can drag an entire organization in its wake when the, the effectiveness is seen in that environment. And all the people who said, we can't do it here, are proven wrong. And the people from that pilot can go to other teams and bring that experience and mentor and coach. And mentoring and coaching is a huge part of this. So then you start to draw a, a then you can start to draw a distinction between legacy IT and modern IT, or uh, new IT, or DevOps IT, right? And if what you repeat, just keep saying that over and over and over. And everybody wants to be on the new stuff and the modern stuff and not on the legacy stuff, right? So everybody starts to get incentivized to change. So um, when you're talking to the business owners, when you're talking to the managers, always talk in terms of business value. Don't talk about tools. Don't talk about Jenkins or Put Chef or Puppet or any of that. Talk about time to market, the resilience of your applications. So to sum up, these are the basic steps. Once you've identified the kind of culture you need, and once you've identified and you're starting to develop your toolkit to accomplish it, you offer the alternative and invite people to join you. And so I'm going to continue to develop this. I'd love to get your feedback. If you follow me on Twitter, share your thoughts with me, email me, let me know what do you think. Go forth and do this and let me know, how, let me know what works. Let me know what doesn't. Let me know what you learn because I want to continue to develop this. Because as far as I know, no one else has ever developed an algorithmic way to change the culture. And this is what I'm attempting to do. And I could really use your help. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.